Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Swai and uh, Mrs. Swai, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. It is my greatest honor to be here to uh, introduce uh, the speaker, Professor Norman Tian, uh, today. Um, many of you may not know that I'm actually a uh, former employee of uh, the Swai Group. <laughs> Some uh, 31 years ago, at that time, I got my degree from the University of Hong Kong. My first uh, full-time job was with uh, John Swai and Sons. So uh, I spent a few years working for Swai before I uh, moved to the US for my graduate study. So that might be another reason that I was chosen to uh, introduce uh, <laughs> the Thai Group Professor of Engineering uh, today. So, um, well, Norman is a well-known expert in uh, microsystem engineering. Uh, he is my predecessor, serving as Dean of Engineering until uh, last year. He uh, built a very strong uh, foundation for the Faculty of Engineering, and this makes my life a lot easier. During his term, the undergraduate curriculum structure of the uh, Bachelor of Engineering uh, program underwent a major transformation. Remember, this is a major transformation. Any minor transformation at Hong Kong U is very, very difficult. So <laughs> he made a major transformation in the curriculum. So we now emphasize a switch towards an interdisciplinary approach. Nowadays, we talk a lot about interdisciplinary approach. But Norman made a major shift to this uh, you know, approach a few years ago. He encouraged innovation and maker culture in student learning. He established the Research Student Center, which I believe is the only one in this region of the world. He put uh, graduate students from different uh, disciplines, forced them to sit together. The beauty is that he is actually making a very good environment for these students to exchange ideas, what we call brainstorming. And we are able to generate a lot of good ideas, uh, making use of this uh, research student uh, center platform. He also established the Innovation Wing, which will become our Innovation and Technology Demonstration Hub. His other major initiatives include the Advanced Robotics Laboratory. Uh, and recently, he also uh, took leadership on developing a major initiative in artificial intelligence and robotics, working together with Tohoku uh, University. So we are most delighted that he is succeeding as the eighth Taiku Professor of Engineering. His topic today is also a very interesting one. Artificial intelligence uh, you know, is one of the uh, most hottest uh, topics today. And he will tell us more about our AI from Doc Yas to AI, a Hong Kong perspective. So may I now invite Professor Norman Tien to uh, deliver his lecture. Norman, please. Ah, all right, got it. So thank you very much, uh, Dean, for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, Merlin, thank you for uh, coming and uh, giving me a very uh, high standard to try to uh, keep in terms of trying to connect dockyards to AI. All right. So l let me give a, give a shot at it. So <clears throat> first, let's talk about Hong Kong, since in the title, we're talking about a Hong Kong perspective uh, in terms of, um, you know, what we're talking, what, uh, in terms of dockyards to AI. So we all know that one of Hong Kong's great attributes is its geographical location. Right. Uh, you can see here how many, uh, perc what percentage of the world's population is within, you know, a short uh, flight uh, from Hong Kong. But uh, you know, over a hundred years ago, you know, Hong Kong's geographic location meant it had access to the resources in China in the region. It had a wonderful port, so it was a wonderful asset. Now, if I talk about uh, Hong Kong's development from, you can see here in the early 1900s to what you see today, a vibrant world-class city, I think there's one word that uh, I think all of you would agree was a major factor in this, and this is commerce. Right? Hong Kong has been a tremendous center of commerce. Now, 
uh, the acting president, uh, Richard Wong, has uh, left. So he's, of course, a very famous economist. Uh, and uh, I, I'm glad he's not here, because what I'm going to talk about may sound simplistic. <clears throat> After all, I'm only an engineer. But for me, commerce is trading goods. All right. So trading goods, that uh, is, in fact, you might say, what really has been uh, something that Swire has been very, very much involved in even before the 1900s, the trading of goods. And one of the things that Swire understood is that the trading of goods required technology. It needed technology because, well, one possibility is that you need the technology to create the physical goods. So here is an example of the Taiku Sugar Refinery. But I think more importantly is that word trade, right? which is that you have to move those goods. And so as Merlin had mentioned, then Swire uh, got involved in, uh, in uh, creating the Taiku dockyards, first to support shipping uh, from the engineering point of view, and then eventually to build ships. Right? So, so in, in a sense, Swire had the foresight to be very heavily involved to bring engineering and technology into commerce in terms of developing Hong Kong. Now, this did not stop. So if we kind of fast forward, let's say, into the 1950s, now the world is changing. Right? Technology is also advancing. Transportation technology is advancing. And now we have air transport. Right? Air transport to go along with maritime shipping. And of course, Swire looked at this and said, well, there's Cathay Pacific, Heiko in terms of aircraft engineering. So Swire has been very heavily involved in commerce, in the development of Hong Kong, on the transportation sector, making tremendous contributions, at least in the air sector. Now, Hong Kong, during this time, is also developing. So there's uh, light manufacturing that's uh, started up, uh, whether that's garment, toys, you name it. These were new physical goods that were coming on board to be traded. People also, in terms of the service industry, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, just the knowledge and the expertise that they had uh, in their brains, people needed to be transported moved around. And of course, the start of financial services and other services here in Hong Kong. So this formula has been going on pretty well, right? Creation of goods, trading and transporting these goods to create value. Well, now we come to today, right? And today, things are changing rapidly. And in some sense, that traditional thinking of moving a physical good is now being replaced by a virtual world. A virtual world in which it's really information that's being traded. And, uh, and the transportation is not necessarily physical. You need information flow. You need idea flow. Or you still have people right, being, uh, you know, uh, people flow in terms of their ideas. But in this now new world of, you might say, virtual goods, uh, we still have services. You see the boom in fintech as a result of this. Um, smart goods, and smart goods may be something as, uh, such as a software program, right? Or it could be drones that are being developed and, and sold. But you're talking about smart goods. You're talking about virtual goods. VR, AR is another example. And you're still talking about people and AI and robotics. So now we are in a different world. Right? And to some extent, it is a challenge for Hong Kong because it's not based on that harbor. It's not necessarily based on that central location that we used to have. So what are we going to do about that? Well, I think the first thing that we want to maybe take a look at is uh, just what this playing field looks like today. Right? And we are in this era of digital transformation. And you can just see um, here some of the catch words that have been out there. 
uh, whether or not it is uh, digital twin technology, we've mentioned AI, robotics, social media, big market, fintech, uh, cryptocurrency, internet of things, e-commerce. I'm not gonna name all of it. It's just to show you we have a really wide open, highly competitive, very diverse um, landscape right now. And very hard for us to be able to you know, put our hands around the whole thing, all right? So we have to pick our places, create our little niches here and there. Okay, so as we're going in and thinking about this, I think one of the things to help is just to understand you know, the, uh, the, the root of what we are talking about, which is information. So what we are in is essentially in an information world. And uh, this uh, pyramid helps me uh, understand, you might say, what's, what, what is happening in terms of the value creation. <clears throat> and so at least in terms of information, you can start with data, all right? Ones and zeros, a temperature measurement, a motion measurement. But it is just a simple number, all right? Or a simple piece of data or a simple measurement. How do you move? from this data to something that has a little bit more value, some more information, right? Then if you can take that information and then gain some knowledge out of that, then it's gonna become even more valuable. So yeah, maybe something simple in terms of an example would be uh, a Fitbit, okay? What a lot of people are wearing these days, all right, in terms of uh, on, your, on your wrist. And so there is some motion sensor in there that's just measuring some motion. That's just data, okay? But it's telling you that I took 10,000 steps, okay? So there was some processing that went on in there, some software that went on in there in order to tell me now some information, which is I took 10,000 steps today, okay? Now that 10,000 steps is of value to me, right? And this is why I would go out and buy a watch or a Fitbit, okay? Or now even more sophisticated, right? An Apple Watch will, the, the newest ones will measure your ECG, okay? So it's taking some data, processing into information saying this is your, well, older watch, Apple Watch series is your heart rate okay, in terms of uh, beats per minute. But now you take that information, uh, you know, work on it some more, process it some more, you get your ECG, and then from there, you may be able to get some knowledge, okay? My pulse rate is too fast, okay? I need that knowledge. Oh, then I can maybe for my human brain say, ah, <coughs> let's see, there was uh, MSG waging at lunch, right? So now I'm, you know, have a heart, high uh, heart rate, okay? This is, this is information. And what we are seeing in today's world is that AI, all the developments in AI. Now AI is maybe at this point an overused word. Has many, many elements underneath it, at least in terms of how, what I'm gonna talk about today. It could be data analytics, what happens in the cloud. It could be machine learning. It could be deep learning. It can just be algorithms to help with pattern recognition. Okay, well, let's lump all of that into AI. It is uh, this kind of uh, software, computer science, algorithmic, you know, machine learning development that is now being able to, we might say, extract even more information, even more knowledge, you know, out of, uh, out of the data. Just give you an example of what AI can do. Uh, you know, recently I was a, a judge at a secondary school AI competition that uh, uh, Anthony, uh, the Wind Foundation, was uh, sponsoring, supporting. And uh, these secondary school students had sensors, right, which will, oh, the, the goal of the competition was how to tell whether or not a strawberry is ripe, okay? So that's knowledge, all right? But how do you get, you know, a ripe strawberry from raw data that involves all that AI, all that processing, right? So there might be a sensor that says, that measures the color. There might be another sensor that measures the size, 
right? But how do you get all of that to saying that it's a ripe strawberry? Okay, this is where, in a sense, AI has been uh, been playing a major role, right? And I have to say, the secondary stu students in Hong Kong are excellent, right? And they've done a good job. But all of this creates value, okay? And actually, all of this information can be of value just by itself, okay? But if it results in some action, maybe a behavioral change uh, in terms of, oh, my heart rate is high, I need to go do something about it, then, then there is some additional value that comes out of this. Or uh, this could be you know, a, uh, in, a in a factory, right? So there's uh, a machine that is uh, you know, having some odd vibration. Okay, and this comes uh, requires some action. That's value, or it's a robot. Okay, or it's a self-driving uh, vehicle. I've got data. I'm gaining information, and it translates into an actual physical action. <laughs> right. So now you can imagine, even as simple as the Apple Watch, right, giving me my heart rate information. I like that. I'm going to go out and buy a watch, all right? I'm going to go buy a Fitbit. And so what you see is just human nature, which is when there is something that is of value, I want more, OK? So this is going to result in a very, very rapidly growing appetite, uh, an insatiable appetite. Right? And already we're beginning to see this in the, in the, uh, in the sense of an explosion of data. And in fact, you know, you're talking about now data being created with some odd words that, you know, I don't ever use, zettabytes or exabytes, right? Uh, out here, by the way, a zettabyte is a trillion gigabytes, just to give you an example, all right? But to help you understand, uh, if you take all the information that's been created throughout human history, this is, you're talking about, you know, the scrolls back in biblical days to Greek philosophers writing whatever to uh, whatever, what's in the libraries, what is in old LP records to everything that has been produced on CDs, right? And on and on and on. Oh, all the documentation in offices. Well, you know, some people basically say that the amount of data and information that's been created in the past year is equivalent, roughly, to all of that that has been created in human history. So data is being generated at a huge explosive rate. Uh, and it's only going to get uh, more. And, and here are, you know, the different, here's transactional data, right? That, uh, but here's the human files, the things that, you know, you produce in your office, uh, for example, PDFs and Word documents, social media. It's generating tremendous amount of data. Some of it's frivolous and some of it is of no use, but that's another lecture, okay? Uh, and then another area that's growing rapidly is machine-generated data. This is the Internet of Things. So this is something that is actually growing tremendously fast. So anyway, <clears throat> so we have an explosion of data. We have this real hunger, this real appetite for more and more. So then it means that we better take a look at then what are some of the elements, and in particular, the hardware elements that are supporting this creation, okay? So if I break down the hardware, uh, there are computers, basically. There's data storage. These are the sensors. There's uh, communications, okay? This is the hardware that's needed. And actually, the Internet of Things is a good example of showing the, that whole spectrum right there. You may have sensors out there, and at this point, we probably have at least billions of sensors out there, perhaps trillions. They're all, many of them are communicating their information somewhere, likely to a central server, a central processor, in the cloud, okay? So all of this is going through communications, needs to be processed and stored, okay? Now, the hardware today is actually not keeping up well with, um, with this explosion in data. And, um, whoops, hold on one second. Let me get uh, here. And now let me go to this slide first, which is 
the hardware is not keeping up. And so your data storage is not enough. Your processors are not capable of handling all that data that's going on. Communications, the bandwidth is limited. You know, this is actually one of the reasons why we're having such a controversy and conflict these days over 5G, right? Because of the value of communications, right? 5G is supposed to really open up the amount of data that you can send, right? The amount of data that you can send at higher rates. I tell you, 5G is not going to be even enough, okay? But it's a massive improvement, but it will quickly also reach its limits. So communication is a problem, latency, which is the speed, privacy, and security. Uh, data storage, data processing. But just to go back one slide, which is on the data gathering. Uh, besides being the Taiku Professor of Engineering, uh, I'm also a Chair Professor of Microsystems Technology. So this is my home field. And so this has been an area that in the last 20 years has been in itself exploding. Uh, just to give you an example, today in an Apple iPhone, this is a list of all the various microsensors that are in there. You have uh, gyroscopes, uh, barometers, accelerometers, of course, cameras, right? Now you'll have three cameras on an Apple iPhone. Uh, and, and one thing that you know, I like to talk about, and, and by the way, this is a Knowles si silicon microphone, but I don't think the Knowles is the same Knowles uh, <laughs> that we had just mentioned uh, from, from, uh, from Swire. Um, but uh, this, is, this is interesting because you know, 20 years ago, when I started in terms of research in this field of microsystems technology, there did not exist a silicon microphone. And actually, it's one of the areas that I did some research in. Today, uh, Knowles has sold billions, billions of, of silicon microphones only within these last 20 years. And uh, just to give you an example, this is about uh, 0.7 millimeters in diameter, so they're small. And by the way, the Apple iPhone has four silicon microphones in there. So the multiplicative effect of all these, these devices that are being built to support this whole drive for information. But you know, this is uh, hidden, people don't see it, but it's, it's growing rapidly. But more and more um, sensors will be developed because we want to be able to measure everything everywhere, right? So some guys at uh, Harvard, in the micro, uh, micro robotics lab are developing these robo bees, okay? And so this is not a giant's uh, fingertip, it's just a human fingertip, <laughs> right? But you can see, though right now there's a little, tiny little wire that's uh, powering it, they want to remove that, and so then you'll have essentially a little sensor that can fly around. Perhaps it will measure a temperature or a measure a humidity. And you can have a swarm of these flying around. Right? This is the future, and as you can imagine, a swarm of them, each one producing data that needs to be sent somewhere. Again, the information explosion is going to, uh, to uh, rapidly rise. It can be in different forms, right? Uh, aircraft structure monitoring, right? Most of uh, the aircraft these days are using more and more composite materials, right? Kyber carbon fiber composites. You can wind fiber, optical, uh, fiber optics into these composite materials to measure, to monitor the structural health of an aircraft fuselage so that you don't have uh, any mechanical failure, cracks, and things of this nature. So it's everywhere, all right? Now, it's everywhere. We have essentially a bottleneck. Usually when you have a bottleneck, you also have opportunities. So I'm going to talk about one opportunity. I'm uh, not going to talk about data storage today, not going to talk about communications, but talk about microelectronics. And so right here you see, uh, you know, I've kind of crossed out Moore's Law. For some of you, uh, you will know that uh, Moore's Law was uh, this uh, thing that was coined by Gordon Moore, 
one of the founders of Intel. And basically what he said was that the number of transistors on a chip will double every 18 months. Okay. And actually, for the most part, he, it was just true. It, it was correct. So the industry followed Moore's law. It just kept doubling the number of transistors on a chip every 18 months. Okay. But like anything, uh, like many, many things in life, there is a lifetime. Though Swire seems to keep going after three <laughs> centuries, which is very good, which is impressive. But for Moore's law, more or less, we've had a 50-year run all right, from, let's say, around the 1970s to today. Why? It's because finally we are reaching the physical limits, the limits of physics. Today, people in the industry are working on five nanometer technology, right? which means on that chip, a feature, the minimum feature size, the smallest feature, is about five nanometers. What's five nanometers? A silicon atom is about 0.2 nanometers, so basically the minimum feature size is about 25 silicon atoms. You can't get much smaller than that. Okay, So the industry, which is feeding this hunger, now has a problem. Okay, So now we need something more than more. Okay, it's, you know, it's a nice little catchphrase, and I'm borrowing it, in fact, because uh, TSMC, which is the world's largest chip foundry out there, customers from Samsung, Apple, and everybody else, they actually now have a vice president who, in his title, is, includes more than Moore's technology. Okay. They have recently hired a, uh, uh, or brought on board a, a new vice president for corporate research as a Stanford professor, happens to be a Hong Kong U alumnus, Philip Wong. Why? Because they, they realize now they need to go beyond the, this traditional uh, graph that they've been going on. Okay? They really need to be thinking of something new, something creative, something innovative. Now, this is an interesting graph because, you know, for some of you, you may remember that roughly 20 years ago or so, uh, Hong Kong thought about getting into the semiconductor chip business, right? And, and it didn't happen. But about 20 years ago, which is to be something like around this point here, uh, hard to see, if you look at this graph, we're, you know, about halfway into this run of Moore's Law. So at that point, and if you look at the number of chips that have been developed then, actually the window was still open okay, for Hong Kong to enter and then be a player into this. But if you look in the last 20 years or so, well, you look at all that, right? No. I mean, within, over the last 20 years, for Hong Kong to then, after having missed that point, to jump in would have been extremely difficult, right? Competition ramped up, technology ramped up. But we're now reaching the end, right? And now, you know, it's become a little bit more of an open playing field. So it is actually become an opportunity for perhaps Hong Kong to take a look at jumping back into this. And in fact, this is going to become a major issue for the whole world because of the demand for new chips. Right? So one of the things here, you can see, uh, here, this is the traditional Intel microprocessor, which for Intel has been tremendous. Okay? Uh, NVIDIA here, uh, for those of you who have kids that like to play computer games, then they would understand an NVIDIA chip, because that's the graphics processing unit. Right? So NVIDIA produced these graphics processing units for supporting computer games, well, among other things. Right? Well, it turns out that uh, these chips, these NVIDIA chips, are very, very good at doing linear algebra, handling matrices. And then also now, you know, independently, the, the computer sciences, scientists out there who are doing deep learning, there's a lot of linear algebra that goes on in terms of deep learning. So now, all of a sudden, NVIDIA produces chips that are excellent for AI deep learning 
development. New market for NVIDIA. But what it represents is that as this information explosion is uh, rising, there's going to be more and more computational demands that may not necessarily be central processing, traditional microprocessors, uh, may not be the most efficient and effective way of doing that. So this is part of the more than mores law activity, where there will be different specialized chips, there will be different new architectures, there will be new physical structures to the chips. It's an exciting time. It's an exciting time for everyone. Okay, so this is Moore's Law, but you know, I was talking about the fact that uh, you know, we're having this bottleneck, right, in terms of all this information going to central processors and central storage in the cloud. So one approach is, of course, to do better processors, which I talked about in terms of Moore's Law. The other approach is to relax, right, the amount of transmission that's going into the cloud, so to speak, right? And this is why some people call, now call edge computing. In other words, doing computing, doing your AI, during your, doing your storage at a local level, all right? Yes, the processors may not be as powerful, the storage may not be as good, it could be a, quote, smaller AI component that's there, but you know, it will relieve, you might say, that uh, pressure uh, on the overall central system. Also, there are certainly applications in which you need to be more on the local level. Here's an example. Image data, let's say this is a self-driving car, autonomous, autonomous vehicle. So you have some image coming in. I'm running, going down the road and I see a lamppost in front of me or a tree in front of me, okay? If I need that to get that image uploaded to the cloud, process it there, then send it back to take some action. In other words, avoid that lamppost, all right? The time it took, ah, it's red, maybe too late, I'm already in that lamppost, okay? Uh, so yes, what does edge computing mean? It means that I take that image, I process that data right there in the car, all right? And I take immediate action. Just one example, right? The Apple Watch is actually also edge computing, right? It's doing a lot of processing right there on your wrist. Right? So it's not all critical systems, but it's you know, also uh, things down there. Here's another example. It's, I think, a cute device that some students at uh, Carnegie Mellon University put together. And you can see from the photo, it's such a small sensor. It's a measurement unit. But they've got a list of about nine different sensors, cameras, microphones, accelerometers, pressure sensors, uh, humidity sensors, uh, temperature sensors on there. And they put it into the kitchen. Okay. And it's got AI on here too, microprocessor, storage, it's got a little bit of machine learning. And so it's just listening or monitoring all the time. And all of a sudden, because you know, there's some microprocessor, there's a little AI there, it can, you can't see this very well, but then all of a sudden it'll say, oh, the water faucet is running, okay? Oh, here, the uh, water kettle started boiling, it finished boiling, the microwave door opened, it closed, Right? So this is taking all those little data, providing some information because of some processing, and then getting some knowledge out of that. And then one can do something with that knowledge. So just give me an example of, you know, I'd say edge computing. Why I br bring up uh, edge computing? Because I think in terms of edge computing, it's a wonderful opportunity in terms of smart goods. Right? as I talked about at the very beginning, for this new world of commerce, smart goods. Smart goods could be you know, related to autonomous vehicles. It could be just some software system, watches a digital twin of whether or not it's an aircraft, a building, a city, a hospital, robotics, VR goggles, you name it. There are many, many smart goods out there. Today, I'm not gonna go into saying what should be done or shouldn't be done. This is up to you guys, right? to think about what might be possible. Um, so of course, we started talking about Hong Kong, right? And so, you know, Hong Kong right now these days has, a, there's a lot of effort in terms of innovation and technology. 
Uh, some of you in the very, very back out there, like George or Nick, may not be able to see. Uh, so I'll, I'll m mention some of this. So uh, I found this from a government website, one of the Hong Kong government websites. To ensure long-term economic stability and growth, Hong Kong must create new and more effective niches through innovation and technology. Okay? Innovation and technology are important to all sectors of the economy, including traditional industries, as well as service industries. They may be applicable to every aspect of the value-adding chain. We envision Hong Kong to be an innovation-led, technology-intensive economy in the 21st century, serving the region as a center for development and commercialization of innovative ideas and technology, in addition to Hong Kong's current role in the business and financial center. Okay, So on the government website, I said, wow, this is perfect. I need to show this. Now, what is, you might say, funny about this is that actually my dad <laughs> spoke those words back in October of 1998. Okay, and so, so you might say, uh, we need to do more. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, as you can see, this, this was at a press conference for the release of the first report for, at that time, the Chief Executive's Commission on Innovation and Technology. Okay, so we do fast forward to today. Okay, so already in the blueprint for the Greater Bay Area, <clears throat> Uh, it has been identified that Hong Kong be an international innovation hub. You might say the international innovation hub to support the greater Bay Area. And so, of course, you know, we, we, here at Hong Kong, we thought we better start working on this, right? And, uh, you know, you, we're good engineers. We look at the problem here and we say, well, Japan is certainly world leader in technology. Nobody will question that. Japan has also been a world leader in robotics and AI. No one will question that. So can we bring Japan to Hong Kong? Okay. In terms of collaborative efforts on innovation and technology, particularly in this area. And then from Hong Kong, let's take a look at some of our attributes. Right? And one of the attributes is Hong Kong is a mega city. Uh, maybe not necessarily in terms of the actual population. There are much bigger cities out there. But in terms of the density, the density in Hong Kong. So it actually makes Hong Kong a perfect test bed for a lot of things that you know, we, would happen, we would do in, for mega cities. And actually, I think you know, if I pull this back to a commerce uh, you know, theme, then the idea is develop things for megacities. We're a perfect test bed for the development. And then outsource it to the rest of the world. Well, to some extent, like what MTR is doing in terms of you know, building train systems elsewhere. So we here at Hong Kong U uh, then have uh, teamed up with Tohoku University in Japan to form a collaboration. So one of the first things in terms of the collaboration is in the uh, AI and robotics area. And so we are working to put together a center for transformative AI and robotics technology. So this kind of trans art center, let's uh, use a coin of phrase, has two you know, um, umbrella themes. All right. One is to address megacity applications. The other one is to look at next generation of manufacturing. And uh, of course, within here, uh, there are some specific projects. We call them pillar projects. Um, future industrial robots, robotics for garment uh, manufacturing, AI and robotics for mega city infrastructure. Collaborative robots, collaborative robots, meaning robots working with and together with humans. Uh, and then robotics for disaster response within megacities. So these, of course, are, you might say, the target you know, application and the target development. But uh, in order to realize these, we need some underlying 
platform, you might call it technologies, underpinning technologies, whether or not it's modeling, system integration, uh, sensing systems, planning, navigation, uh, cyber physical systems. These are things that we need in terms of underpinning technologies. And as it turns out, uh, Tohoku University is very good at the robots and the development of robots and the research into, into robots. Hong Kong U is actually very strong. Though we have robotics, we also are extremely strong in these underpinning technologies. So this collaboration is, in fact, quite synergistic. The outcome should be much bigger than what each of us are able to do. So next few slides, I'm running out of time. Uh, I'll just give you some, a snapshot of some of the technologies that Tohoku and Hong Kong are bringing to the table rather than talking about what we will be doing into the future. But uh, giving some examples, uh, Professor Kosugi, who is essentially the co-PI for this particular project, um, has been doing a lot in terms of collaborative robots and future industrial robots. Uh, one very challenging problem with, uh, for robotics is actual two-arm manipulation of something. If you look at a General Motors Toyota automobile plant, it's one arm, because one arm is easy, okay? Two arms is actually not that easy, okay? Just in terms of even manipulating this laser pointer here with two arms is not easy, okay? So Professor Kosuge, who is actually here in the audience, has been working on dual arm manipulator, manipulation systems, something that will be very needed as we move to more advanced manufacturing, where we want the robotic system to be more flexible, being able to have higher functionality. Uh, this, of course, has been fun for him, uh, doing dance partner robots, either uh, a dance partner or a dance teacher, okay? But you can imagine that uh, this is a challenge because if that robot steps on your foot, okay, it could hurt a lot, right? So, um, so this is something that, uh, you know, is a good vehicle, but uh, you can't see this photo too well. Uh, it's a bit dark in the image, but the, the real industrial application, of course, is having a robotic system working with the person here in terms of being able to uh, provide, uh, bring tools. It's kind of like in a surge operating room in a hospital where somebody's handling, handing the doctor scalpels and clamps and things of this nature, right? Uh, just go through real quick. Uh, we've got uh, people who are working, for example, Wenping Wang, who is working on vision systems, Japan, uh, motion planning, how you actually plan the motion of these robots, Gawai doing uh, uh, manipulation of robots in medical systems, VR, AR systems by Henry, uh, Henry Lau, and uh, Internet of Things by George Huang. Um, and then for disaster response and megacity infrastructure, uh, we are actually fortunate to have Satoshi Tadakoro from Tohoku University be involved. Uh, he is well known in Japan because after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster, in which robots failed, right, in trying to, uh, in going in afterwards in terms of disaster response, that the Japanese cabinet directly funded uh, his research in trying to develop new robotic systems. Uh, one that's come out is uh, Quince for uh, search and rescue. He's also been working on firefighting robots. Uh, there was some news, news media uh, press recently uh, on this uh, here in Hong Kong as, uh, as part of what we plan to do for the new center. Uh, everything from uh, here a gripper that uh, operates under harsh environments, high temperatures, to uh, different forms of uh, firefighting. This is something that uh, we actually at Hong Kong, you have uh, a lot of effort in, which is in looking at infrastructure and infrastructure modeling and prediction. So this is where you take uh, AI, essentially, and sensors. You look at crowdsourcing, sensing the crowds, Okay, and looking at crowd patterns, for example, to help you determine uh, building maintenance asset planning. Okay, one of the things that we want to do 
uh, for example, in terms of disaster response, would be look at evacuation planning or routing under, let's say, you know, certain incidents that may happen. Let's say MTR breakdown, all right? Then how do you route traffic within the city? Foot traffic, road traffic, bus traffic, uh, as an example, right? And this is applications where AI can come into being. All right, so let me wrap up uh, a little bit here. Uh, we are, without a doubt, in this era of digital transformation. And in this era of this digital transformation, first, tremendous growth in wealth. I'm, t I'm talking about in terms of global wealth, the GDP, right? Because economic opportunities. And because there are great economic opportunities, there is no way that the technology will, uh, be, will not advance. And there's no way that the technology will not advance rapidly. But this rapid advancement of uh, the technology will mean, well, there could be workforce changes. There will be societal changes and lifestyle changes. Uh, don't have time to get into all of this, but uh, there is also ethics issues that will come up. Social media is a very simple, easy to understand example. Fake news, is it fact or fiction? That has tremendous impact on our society. And there are a lot of ethics issues involved. Or it could be even something as uh, straightforward as a critical system as what's happened with the 737 MAX, in which the AI system was a factor, a likely a factor, in the two accidents in Indonesia and in Ethiopia. So, so we are entering a world in which there is a lot of change, and in fact, policy and laws are not keeping up. Just like the hardware is not keeping up with the data explosion, our policies and our laws are not keeping up with the technology advancements. So something for you know, all to be aware of that these things have to come along. Now, oftentimes when I'm, you know, I'm at a university, <clears throat> Uh, you know, people are always asking me, yes, with all this workforce change that's, uh, you know, imminent, what, what should I do, okay? <laughs> and it is a changing job landscape, and it's serious, right? I mean, self-driving vehicles, you can already see that uh, drivers, that occupation will go away, right? It will only be people who want to drive it as a hobby, right, that you will actually go out to learn to drive. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, where the biggest change and may be hard to stomach actually will be in the professional services, right? Many of the people who are working in the legal profession, you know, they, they just extract, you know, old cases. They do research, combing, you know, for information and then doing some, you know, analysis. That will be replaced by AI. Uh, the medical profession, right? Uh, I see Rosie here. Thinking, thinking about the medical profession, if you look at, uh, you take a radiologist, right, and they're looking at an x-ray and looking for bone breaks. Yes, I think an AI system will someday be able to do that just as well as a doctor. E I tell, you know, uh, even when I'm uh, out uh, uh, in, in the faculty, that some professors for some professors, their job will change too, <laughs> okay? Some of the teaching, or at least some of the ways that some of our professors teach will, can be replaced by online kinds of, you know, tools, right? But the research, the research will also change. There are professors, let's say in material science, where they, it's been trial and error, okay? I try a new material, I make the measurements. Yeah, that can be actually systematically replaced by AI and robotics. There have been a lot of professors who do tremendous amount of numerical modeling and numerical simulation, numerical developments. Well, yeah, some of that stuff may also change, okay? So even for professors, okay, actually going into the future, there are two things that really people need to try to nurture, grow, and enhance. 
That is creativity and innovation. Okay? This is, in fact, something that, at least in the near term, AI systems are, may not be able to do that well. Okay? So whether or not, again, it, whether or not you're a professor, whether or not you're a manager, and you have to manage people who are going to be you know, more focused on creativity and innovation, whether or not you're a young, there are some students here, green gown, with their green gowns on, I would encourage over the years, whatever years you have remaining here at Hong Kong U and then beyond, to hone that creativity, that innovation, because those are going to be the things of value to society that at the moment AI and robotics are not going to be able to do. And there's a beauty to creativity uh, and innovation, and creativity is that you can't use it up, right? This is a quote from Maya Angelou, who is uh, an American famous, was a famous American writer and poet. You can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. So thank you very much.